Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. I'm D.H. Taylor. Today, I want to talk about something that's been on my mind for a few weeks now. Inflation. Inflation's coming, and it's going to get bad. Here's the thing. It's going to affect the stock market, but it's going to affect the stock market differently in different ways. And I wanted to break down how this all plays out. We're going to see upward movement in commodity prices. We're seeing it now. It's going to continue. Eventually, the Federal Reserve is going to have to step in and change interest rates. They're going to have to stop buying bonds as they have been doing, number one. Number two, they're going to have to start raising interest rates. It's the only thing that's going to combat inflation. We're seeing a perfect storm right now. The economy is reinvigorating. But there's also some outlying factors out there that are really hyper-pushing the economy in certain ways. And this is what's driving all of this. It's going to get worse. It's going to get far worse. We're all seeing it. Prices at the pump, food prices, things like this. We're all feeling it. And it's going to get worse. So how do you protect yourself? What can you do? Well, there's a big difference between a value investor and a speculator. Speculators may actually love this kind of activity. Simply because this is going to be a great chance for them to step into the market, make a quick buck and get out. That's what speculators do. Value investors, for those who are looking to own stocks for, say, one, two and a half, five, ten, twenty-five years, what do you do? Well, my advice on that one, I'll tell you in a minute, but you're probably going to like it. Let's break down what's going on. I'm going to break down the economic indicators that are out there. Then I'm going to go ahead and, and sort of sort out what will happen with the stock market in the coming months and quarters and how this will play out and what you can do to protect your wealth. Let's look at some numbers. This is a look at non-farm payrolls. Every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at how many jobs are created. We get this on the first Friday of every month. And if you look at this chart, there's two portions that are yellow. Those are negative. The first one that you see on the far uh, left there, that's the dot com when the dot com era, uh, the recession there. It was very mild. After that, you could see how many jobs uh, George W. Bush created. It wasn't exactly robust, but we didn't really lose a lot of jobs. So the, con the economy kind of continued forward. Then, of course, as W. was leaving the office, uh, he left a mess. And this is what Obama inherited. Um, since then, the next chunk there, uh, all that blue there, that's Obama into uh, Trump. And here's the thing that's probably most important. Two things, actually. I see these debates all the time. Which president created the most jobs? If you look at these numbers, they're basically flatline in the sense that both uh, the entire economy created the same amount of jobs on a regular basis throughout that entire period. Neither one of them really outperformed the other. Of course, Obama walked into a mess and Trump left a mess, neither of which were either individual's faults. Um, that being said, let's look at the continu continuation of this. a little difficult to see but if you look on the far right side of that chart and i don't have control over the colors or anything like this where i'd make them uh it wouldn't be yellow it'd be red um i get these charts from tradingeconomics.com wonderful site one of my favorite sites when the pandemic hit 20 million jobs were lost immediately that is a huge number since then, you can see that there was a big spike, and I have another chart, but I wanted to show this 20 million loss compared to what was going on with the economy prior to that. Uh, it was an astronomical amount. Let's look at one more chart. It kind of brings things into better perspective. So all the way on the far left there, you can see the 20 million that was lost. And then immediately the economy bounced right back. Um, there was one other month where there were some losses. But outside of that, the economy has picked up about 13 million jobs, 13 and a half million jobs, if my uh, memory serves me correctly, of the 20 million that are lost. That's pretty fast. 
there's really nothing that we can attribute that to other than the fact that there was an immediate jolt and then people re kind of engineered their lives. A lot of gig workers started doing gig work, uh, things of that nature. Um, nonetheless, we are now at a point where jobs are really going to start driving the economy. This is the, this is the vacation season. All right. Number one, number two, simultaneously sort of a perfect storm, if you will, over 50% of the country has an, a vaccine. So they feel entitled to go out there and just live life that they have that ability. And based on the information we're getting from CDC and stuff like this, that's, exactly what they should be doing, living as normal life as possible. Um, given that, there's going to be a huge surge in activity. Now, we're down about 7.5 million jobs from, uh, from what we lost. My expectation is probably over this summertime, we pick up between 1.5 and 2.5 million jobs over June, July, and August. We'll see these numbers July, August, and September. Then September, October, November, December, the last four months of this year, I expect another two and a half to say three and a half million more jobs created as the economy moves forward more and more, as more and more people get vaccinated and we return to our normal lives. Well, all that job creation, that sounds awesome. And it is, except for one thing. It's going to really push this economy out into a distorted area. We are still reeling from supply issues. Those supply issues mean that there are shortages of certain products throughout the world. The supply chain has not caught up. They're desperate to do so. And the United States is ahead of the game when it comes to vaccinations. Other countries are not at the same level. So although we may be moving forward, a country that uh, isn't as advanced as ours, isn't a G20 country, but supplies us products may not be there. And because of that, there may be supply issues. This is going to drive prices upward in various act, uh, areas, food, energy, things like this. Five trillion dollars. Most of it out of thin air. The Federal Reserve just started hitting the bottom. We did borrow some of the money, but the United States of America invented five million dollars and the burden of that fell onto the Federal Reserve. They just expanded the money supply. If you look at this chart to begin with, you can see all the way um all the way over on the right hand side, you can see the astronomical spike in what just happened. These that five trillion, that's all three stimulus programs added together. The important thing about this is this is M1 money supply. There are three levels of money supply that the uh, United States watches M0, M1, M2. We used to look at M3. For whatever reason, Greenspan decided it was no longer worth it. This money, most of it, M1, is demand deposits. That means what's in your checking account. M0, cash in your pocket, actual pieces of paper, coins, things like that. That is M0. M1, demand deposits, things that you can immediately get to. You write a check, you use your debit card, things like this. You walk into a bank, hey, let me get 500 cash, whatever. This is also the money that if it's in the bank, which it is a demand deposit, this is what the banks will use in their reserve ratios when it, they determine what to loan out. We use a fractional banking system here in the United States. So a bank may have a reserve requirement and the number moves frequently. Um, I saw something come out of the Federal Reserve Bank out of New York saying that it is now zero, which scared the bejesus out of me. I'm not certain. I didn't go too far down that road, but that one kind of scared me. But let's just say it's 5%. That if the economy needs, or if the, the banking system is required to have 5%, if you drop $1,000, $10,000, $100,000 into the bank account, the 
the bank has to keep 5% of that on reserve. And this goes for every single depositor. They can loan out the other 95%. So what's likely to happen is the banks are now sitting on nitro fuel. If you look at these charts, it's a little difficult to see uh, just because of the perspective of the chart, but just before the pandemic, we had a money supply of $4 trillion. We're sitting at $17 trillion right now. That's 300%, over 300%. This economy is going to explode, implode, not sure which adjective to use. Nonetheless, as banks start loaning this money out, it's going to get ugly fast. This is mortgage rates. There was a, the Freddie Mae, Fannie Mae, the Mays, twin sisters, if you will, they came up with some programs to ensure that homeowners would not be evicted uh, based on, from the pandemic. There were other things built into the uh, stimulus programs. Because of these programs and because of the Federal Reserve buying bonds and things like this, mortgage rates have been driven down to historical levels. This chart goes back many years. If you look back around 2008 or so, mortgage rates are lower now than they were in the housing bubble. That should be very alarming to you. And when I show you the housing price numbers, you'll understand why that is alarming. Mortgage rates are so low, people are able to buy a very big house. They're starting to bid on houses that basically they normally wouldn't be able to afford. And because when interest rates are so low, the extra that they're paying, they're saving via their mortgage. So there's been a huge boom in housing. How huge? Let's look at some numbers. This is home ownership rates. If you look backwards to about 1994, when Clinton was in office, they came in and they retooled the banking laws that uh, were ripped, uh, set in place after the Great Depression in the 1930s. Because of that, this changed the structure of home ownership. And if you look from 1994 to uh, basically 2006, just before the bubble burst, there was a, a, a huge line upward outside of what was normal. Now, this chart goes all the way back to the 1960s. So it gives you kind of a perspective that for 30 years, we had a what we would consider a baseline number for home ownership. Then they changed things. Now, what is baseline home ownership rates? Some could argue any kind of number you want, basically saying, well, from the 1930s to the 1960s, this was the baseline. Now we have a, from the 60s to the 90s, we have a new baseline. And now in the new era, we have the current baseline. This, of course, resulted in a huge implosion in the housing market and financial crisis. So, you know, I don't really want to say that this is distorted in any way because we don't really have a baseline kind of concept as to what would be normal. They changed the laws. We got a new baseline number for home ownership rates. <clears throat> Given that, you can see the decline that happened in 2008, 9, and 10, all the way into uh, the, the middle teens. Now, of course, we're starting to see an uptrend. Um, I'm not certain on some of these data points because there was a huge spike there, but then it came right back down. And I'm not sure if there was some anomalous data that happened there. We will see over the next couple quarters. But let's look at pricing on home uh, homeowners. This is housing price activity. In the middle there, the yellow numbers, that is, these are declining numbers. These are month-over-month -month increases. And 
it's a little difficult to see in this particular one. You really have to understand charts and things of that nature. But if you look in the center, you can see where the housing bubble collapsed and prices declined mostly. That's where all the yellow is. All right. Month after month, prices were lower and lower. These are negative numbers. Prior to that, you had numbers that were hitting right around 0.5 or so monthly increase in prices. Take a look at the most recent data. We're seeing numbers 1.5% increase on average throughout the entire nation for housing prices. This exceeds what we saw in the housing bubble back in 2006, 7, and 8. So this should be alarming. But it all makes sense. When you have mortgage rates that are distorted the way they are, people are buying houses. And it's, it's driving people into home ownership rates that are much higher. Price activity is increasing significantly. Unfortunately, what goes up eventually usually comes back down. I've shown this chart a few times. This is lumber and this is ugly. This chart goes all the way back to the early 1990s. We've never seen prices like this before. There are multiple factors involved here. Number one, the pandemic and the supply chain shut everything down. Then you had mortgage rates falling down to ultra low levels, which is driving people to go and buy houses. We see how price home prices are heading higher. Because of the shortages in lumber, lumber prices are skyrocketing. These are levels we've not seen ever. Uh, you could have purchased lumber for about $400 a foot board at one point just back in January. Now you're looking at $1,200, $1,600. It's moving fast. It has seems like it's kind of peaked out. I don't know that we're going to come back to down to normal for some period of time. I'm not sure if the high is in place yet. I don't think that the Federal Reserve, anything that they could do would affect lumber in a very quick way. If they did do anything, they would stop buying bond purchases and they would start increasing interest rates. This would have ripple effects throughout the entire United States and the world. Home prices would eventually come back down and eventually lumber supplies would catch up. This could take anywhere from 9, 12, 15, 18, 24 months to happen which means these elevated prices are here for a minute. The U.S. 10-year yield. This has been trending higher. It's sort of kind of taken a back burner uh, move at this point, but I expect things to change here as early as tomorrow. For those who are watching this uh, today, the CPI report comes out Thursday morning, and I expect that this number is not going to be pretty, that this is going to show about 4.7% year-over-year increase in inflation rates. That would push the 10-year yield, the longer end of the yield, much higher, simply because the message would be on the board that interest rates are going up. But I don't expect this to be the beginning of the end. I expect the markets to kind of just keep on partying for quite some time until the Federal Reserve begins their work. That might be six months from now. They have just announced that they're still purchasing corporate bonds. All right, that is keeping interest rates at ultra low levels. Until they remove that, bonds can't move to their more natural level. Because the Federal Reserve is doing what they're doing, the stock market is probably going to keep going up, which means that when it comes down, it's going to fall even further. Latest activity on uh, SPX or S&P 500 um, pushing towards all-time highs. My expectation, the CPI number is ugly, and then things turn right back around and head right back up. Um, for those who are involved in cannabis stocks or any other sector, tech or whatever, 
This will continue for some time. We'll probably see some selling as we get inflation data. And then as soon as people forget about it, they start buying again because the Federal Reserve hasn't changed the dynamics of the market. So why would they be concerned? So I don't think that our high is in place yet. I think we probably challenge that. And I think we challenge it in a big way that it just keeps going. Keep in mind, this economy is about to go gangster with everybody getting out there all through the summertime. Imagine you've been cooped up for a year. You don't have to imagine too hard because you've probably been cooped up for a whole year. Now it's summertime. You just got vaccinated. You're now out there doing your thing, spending money, pushing the economy. So this is probably going to uh, show robust numbers, economic data, retail sales, uh, employment numbers, things like this. The economy is going to push forward. But for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We've not caught up with supply levels. There's going to be a huge surge in economic activity. I've seen videos where people are taking trucks. It's hilarious. They're taking they're Ford 150s, putting kitty bathtubs in the back and going to gas stations and filling them up because price. Okay, this is going to put more strain on prices because there's more demand. And as people, as price keeps going up, people are going to get more creative filling up their garbage bags. We've all seen these videos, they're hilarious and dangerous and hilarious. Um, we're going to continue to see this. This is going to drive up the price of oil. Oil is in everything. Everything. Fertilizer, plastics, you name it. This ripples all through the economy. Pushes up all prices. Food prices go up because of fertilizer prices. Because of transportation costs and things like this. As oil continues higher, as gas prices keep moving higher, people will step in and demand more and more. Buying it as much as they can storing it because of price movements. This is classic economics 101 inflation. What can you do? The stock market is going to continue to move higher, but inflation is going to continue to move higher as well. We're going to see commodity prices continue moving higher as demand is pressured on the supply that we do have. With the rest of the world still kind of reeling, but the United States entering out of this uh, pandemic with a lot of people vaccinated and a lot of people wanting to get back to normal as best they can, we're going to have supply issues for a while. This is going to have price pressures for a while. The Federal Reserve eventually is going to have to stop buying corporate bonds and mortgages, MB, uh, the MBSs and things like this. And at that point, there's going to be sort of a turn on the economy. What if the Federal Reserve stopped buying bonds? Bond rates would go back to their normal levels. Go, go back to the thinking on, on the mortgage rate that I showed you. That is way below normal. And it's even below the, 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 the level that we had during the... Um, uh, the Great Recession just prior to that that drove the housing bubble. You've seen the prices of housing on a month over month basis, how they're increasing 1.5% when even during the uh, housing bubble before, it was only 0.5%. This is three times higher. And it's doing this month after month after month. Once the Federal Reserve starts st stops buying bonds and then they also start raising interest rates, short-term interest rates. That's it. The floor is out. But this may take six to nine months. And until then, even though we're going to get some data coming in on inflation over and over again, saying there's a lot of inflation, the Federal Reserve is kind of taking a, a stance that, well, we want to see the economy pick back up. And that's understandable. But there are going to be artificial supply issues which is going to push up uh, demand, and that is going to cause even more inflation. The problem with inflation is you got, get guys who have trucks, and they put little kiddie pools in the back of the trucks, and they start filling it up with gasoline. 
That's the thing with inflation. Why are they doing that? Because prices keep going up. So they need to buy as much as they can today. This drives inflation. We're going to continue to see this. Lumber, forget about it. I had someone uh, over the weekend send me an email saying he wanted to put together a, um, a roof for his kid's uh, sandbox. 130 bucks for two slabs of uh, plywood for a roof. And he said that drove home the point that I've been saying inflation is coming. Let's look at some things here. First, what are you? A value investor or a speculator? Now, I, my cannabis investing, I'm buying these stocks and I'm forgetting about them. I may buy more and more here and there. As a speculator, I play around with the cryptocurrencies when I can. Prices have been moving so much that my game doesn't quite work out. What I do is called uh, Delta Neutral Options Trading. I step into the market and I buy an overnight option, say a put on uh, Bitcoin. I may buy two coins, two puts, all right, and then I'll go long the underlying. If the market goes up, I make money. If the market goes down, I make money. If the market stays the same, I lose money. The problem with that strategy is it takes a rolling 10-day average of price movement and price movement has been so exaggerated lately that options prices even though they're overnight they're a little rich on the premium so i don't i haven't been trading these for a, a while a couple weeks now several weeks given that i i scratch that itch if you will for my speculating with crypto I may jump in here and there if I see something that's blatantly obvious to me. Some of the selling that we saw over the uh, past couple weeks, I sat there and I said, that's going down even further. I sold a little bit, nothing major. Um, but when it comes to cannabis investing, I buy these stocks and I walk away. Look at the master at this, Warren Buffett. His favorite saying, when others are greedy, be fearful. When others are fearful, be greedy. Where are others right now? They're greedy on commodities. All right, we are at all-time highs for the stock market. But I don't think the all-time highs are there yet. I think we're probably still going to go higher, which to some means good news. But I caution you, it is not a one-way street. The inflation numbers we're about to get may, may knock a tooth out of this economy or the stock market. We'll see how that plays out. But you need to ask yourself the question, what are you, a speculator or a value investor? For me, 10, 25 years is how long I'm going to be holding on to some of these stocks. If your time frame is far shorter, you fall out of the value investing kind of criteria and may be more speculative. And then you're going to have to approach this in a different way. But trust me, look around. There's going to be plenty to be speculating on because prices are going to be soaring. Um, as a value investor, another saying Warren Buffett always says, my favorite position is forever. He never sold any stocks based on price alone in the sense that, wow, I think the stock market's going to come down. Let me take some profits off. But there's ways to take profits off if you think that the market is going to go down. Uh, if you're sophisticated enough and set up properly, buy some puts on the S&P 500. It's real simple. If the market goes down and your long puts, your puts go in the money. You make money. This might hedge your position for your long-term holdings. This is something you're going to need to decide where you are. But that is an opportunity. I'm looking at buying puts on the S&P 500 going forward in the next couple weeks to months. Because I absolutely believe that the S&P 500 is going to come down in a big way. Maybe 10, 15, 25%. But it may take time. 3, 6, 9, probably more like 6, 9 to 12 to 15 months. So I'm looking at very long term how this plays out. Because when the Federal Reserve does finally make a move, it takes about six to nine months for that to ripple through the economy. 
It doesn't happen immediately. I've said this before. Economics, investing, you name it, whatever it is, it's not an event. It's a process. And if you approach this whole thing like a process, you'll probably do okay with it. Uh, as I mentioned, the puts, you can get put options uh, on a weekly basis with the S&P 500. It's not my thing to get into on a regular basis, but I'm fully capable. I can step in and say, all right, let me look at the markets and let's build a position here. Um, and I think that's actually a very solid opportunity for someone who does believe that the uh, S&P 500 will be falling down. I absolutely believe it will. I just don't know when it starts. It might start tomorrow. Hard assets. Commodity prices are going higher. Oil is going higher. Gold is going higher. Lumber is going higher. We're seeing food prices. Uh, the cattles. Um, wheat, corn, sugar, things like this. They're starting to edge up higher because of shortages in China and demands on China for feeding the country and things like this. Another asset that you want to kind of look at to pick up crypto one of the beautiful things about crypto is there's a finite supply i've shown you charts where you can see the complete and utter dilution of our money and purchasing power nothing got diluted with crypto my favorite crypto coins now i know doge gets its its memes if you will that's a garbage currency. I don't even understand why it shows up. It moves quickly around the earth. Um, the costs are low, but it's not my favorite. Bitcoin tends to be the favorite because it's been around and most people are in, in on it. And when institutions start getting in on a big way, they're going in on cri crypto, uh, Bitcoin. But I like Ethereum. I like uh, Binance. I like Binance a lot simply because Binance kind of created their own um, uh, system there and it's growing it continues to grow another currency i like stellar so stellar binance ethereum those three they have purpose ethereum has a lot of purpose and that's probably the one that i like the most believe it or not i like bitcoin just because it's bitcoin but it's expensive and it's slow ethereum solves that and it's actually being used in banks. There's contracts involved and things like this. Ethereum is more, less of a, less of a currency, more like the internet itself with agreements attached to it. It's maybe we shouldn't go down that road. Nonetheless, you can take steps to get prepared for what's happening, but you have to understand it is happening. This inflation, you're probably going to go out sometime this week and be like, Wow, look at that. I can't believe the price of that. That's your wake-up call. This is that sending it home. This is happening. It's just going to get worse. Eventually, the Federal Reserve is going to have to step in and make changes. In the meantime, expect a lot of choppy trading. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Then down. Down in a big way. Prepare now. You can make some money. I want to say thanks for all those stopping by. If this is your first time stopping by my website, just down below, free email newsletter. I send it out as, as often as I can. Had some issues with YouTube, still not exactly settled. So I've been delayed over the past couple of days getting some videos out there. I'm waiting to kind of hack that out. Nonetheless, I'm going to push these videos up as quickly as I can because I need to because of the timeliness. Um, and I'll just deal with YouTube when I can. Hit that email newsletter. Hit the subscribe button. Really appreciate you stopping by. See you in the next video. Thank you.